itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. You guys could go ahead and have a seat. Uh, welcome. My name is Ricky. I serve as one of the pastors here. So good to be with you guys this morning. Um, so the coaching staff noticed that, that as practices, as games went on, that the athletes, their endurance, their performance, their stamina, everything just started to drop as, as the wear and tear of, of everything went on, uh, you know, under the heat, under the humidity. So the coaches were like, man, we, there's got to be a way to solve this. And so they go to make a request to some researchers there at the school. And they say, hey, can, you know, we have water, but can you do something to, to actually kind of like really solve this problem? Because we need to do something that water can't do. And so the researchers uh, begin to, to do, you know, they begin to dig in and everything. And they're like, all right, what, what is it that, that these athletes really need? What is it that, they, that their bodies are losing as they're in, uh, you know, performing these, these athletic events and, and all these things? And then later, in the year 1965, Gatorade was born, right? And, um, you know, Gatorade w was unique at the time because <clears throat> it gave players all of these things that, they, that their bodies actually really needed to continue to perform at a high level. It, it, yes, it hydrated them, but it also gave them electrolytes, potassium, uh, phosphate, sugars, you know, something that, that water couldn't do alone. And so that was 1965. And then just uh, shortly after this, the Florida Gators won their first Orange Bowl. And they, they, they credit, man, it was the Gatorade that made the difference. And even when they asked uh, the, the Georgia Tech coach of the Yellow Jackets, they said, man, what, what was it? And uh, Bobby Dodd, he replied, we didn't have Gatorade. That made the difference. You know, it, like, like, and we, we can kind of think of that when it comes to, to sports. It's like, yeah, yeah, you, you kind of need this and you need that so that you perform at a high level so that actually things go the, really the way that you need them to. But, but what about when it comes to, to like you? What about when it comes to, to your life, to, to pursuing uh, knowing God, to really know, like knowing who he is, growing in intimacy with God, leaning into what God has, has made you and what he's called you to be, what is that thing that's going to make the difference? What's that unique thing that provides you, provides not just you, but provides even the world, hey, this is, this is what you've been kind of missing. What is that thing? You know, and the thing is, is that, like, God actually shows us that. And in Scripture, you know, he points to it. It's like, hey, you know what the, the world needs, just out, like, outside of Jesus? It needs God's people. You know what you really need? God's people. Family. Community. You know, that, that's the, the family of God. But here's what I think happens to a lot of us. I think what happens to a lot of us is that we kind of just settle for water. I think we're like, no, nah. we, we're just kind of fine, but we don't actually lean into what God is, has actually wants us to lean into, what our souls really need. Because it's like, man, this is what your soul really needs and this actually, like, the family of God produces something far more than what you think. And so we're going to be looking at that today. If you've got a Bible, open up to Ephesians 4. Um, Ephesians 4, it's in the New Testament. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. But um, as you're turning there, we've been going through this series called Follow Me. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? And we've been going through these identities. Because being a disciple of Jesus is not just, hey, you do these things. It's who, you, who we are. And we talked about being a worshiper, that man, all of our life is worship to God. 
um, to love him, to know him, followers that were being with Jesus, were becoming more like Jesus, a steward that, that everything that we have doesn't really ultimately belong to us, it belongs to God, and it's to be used for his purposes, servant that, that we're, we're, our life isn't about us, we're here to serve others, witness that, that we're to be, to share the gospel, to share and to show the good news to this world, um, and that, that we are, we talked about a couple weeks ago, that we actually all, as disciples of Christ, are also disciple makers. You know, that we're not here to just make converts of Christ. You know what Jesus says in Matthew 18, but we're actually here to make disciples, to reproduce ourselves, to help other people be followers of Jesus. And today, <clears throat> the identity that we're looking at is family member. That as a disciple of Christ, as, a, as it's like, yes, I believe in Jesus. It's, okay, what, is, what does that mean to be a disciple that you're a family member, that you and I are family members, that, that, that God created a family together. And so we're, today we're going to look at like, okay, what does that mean to be a family member? But also what does it mean to have like as a family, what does that mean to like have like family culture, right? We're a gospel family. What does that mean to actually live that out? What, sh what should we be looking like as a family? And I'll admit, this is like an area that I'm super passionate about. This is like one of the ones I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, and I get all excited about that. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're going to just, let's dive in the text. And here's, here's the first observation. Here's the first thing that we're going to see is this, the foundation of family, the foundation of family. And so, whoops, I actually did not turn there. Uh, Ephesians 4. So, so Paul, he's writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, Ephesus verse 1. He says, therefore, all right, you knew it was coming. I'm going to pause right. Therefore, everything that he's been talking about, that's what he's referring to. What Paul just talked about, there, because of all of that. Well, so what has Paul been talking about? In chapter 1, he's been saying, you have, man, we have these spiritual blessings in Jesus, that he's lavished on us, poured out for us for his glory and for his purposes. Chapter two, it says that we've been saved by grace through faith, and it's this gift of God. We were dead in our sins, but now we've been made alive in Christ. And then Paul goes on to say, hey, because of that salvation that we have in Christ, because of the gospel, he talks about in chapter two, now there's this peace between Jews and Gentiles between two separate people groups. It's like, hey, you thought they were separate, but they're not. Because of the gospel, God is bringing people together to make this new people, to make the church, to make the family. And so we just see like the, the foundation of family is Jesus. It's the gospel. And so, so when Paul says, therefore, he's referring back to all that. So he's like, hey, because of the gospel, because Jesus has saved us by his grace, because he's made this new family, because he's broke, broken down hostility between people groups, verse one, Therefore, I, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. That, that's this calling that we have in Christ. The, the calling is what? Is salvation in Christ and new family in Christ. Because that's what he's been spelling out. And he says, therefore, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. Received with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3, um, making, or, uh, making every effort, right? Or, or sorry, verse, uh, yeah, verse 3, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Again, he's talking about, this is the foundation. The bond of peace is what? What, what binds us together? Christ, the gospel, that that. We're saved not by works, right? That we're not saved by, by how good we are. We're saved by grace through faith. And then notice, this is where he really starts using all this very singular language here. There's one body. So when you think of like, okay, so we're supposed to walk worthy of the calling that we have to Christ and to one another. And then he's pointing us like, hey, this is, this is why you walk worthy. This is why we live this out. This is who we are. And he's pointing to these things because we're one body, right? The, we're one church. We're the, we're the body of Christ. Romans 12, 5 says, though you're many, you're one body in Christ. We're individually members of one another. And so he's, he's just talking about this unity that we have there in uh, verse four. And then he goes on 
So there's one body, one spirit. If you've trusted in Jesus, he gives you the Holy Spirit. And the same Holy Spirit that fills you, the same Holy Spirit that fills Paul right here, is the same Holy Spirit that fills me. It's all the same Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that guides, comforts, convicts, leads all believers. So he's talking about all of these things that we have in common, one body, one spirit. Next, he goes, one hope. You know what all of us are banking on? Christ. What's your hope? Christ. What's my hope? Christ. He's the only one that can save us. Right? You need Jesus just as much as I need Jesus. It's not like I need him less and you need him more. We all, we're all, I 100% need Jesus. He is my hope. He's your hope. He's the hope of the world. And so he's pointing again to all these things in common. Next thing he says, verse five, one Lord. Man, who's in charge of you? Who's in charge of us? Right, the, the one that's in charge of me ultimately has authority. He's my Lord, is Jesus. Same, same for you. He's our Savior and our Lord, our God. And then he goes on, what, verse five, one faith. And we were, we were all dead in our sin. We were all all lost, broken people that were separated from God. And the only way that any of us can be forgiven, the only way for any of us to know God, have a relationship with God, spend forever with him, be adopted into the family of Christ, have, have eternal life is because of Christ. That's, that's all of us. We, we all have that faith in Jesus and our, our faith is not in ourselves. Our faith is not in elections or any of those things. Our faith is in Jesus. And Paul is saying, man, this is who you are. You, this is the foundation of what makes us who we are. Our, makes us this family is one Lord, one spirit, one hope, one faith. Then he goes on, one baptism. We all have this, this common identification with Christ, in Romans 6, it says that we've been united with him in his death. We will be united with him in his resurrection. We were, you know, our old self was gone away with. Our new self has come. We all have this one baptism that we are identified with Christ, but we're also identified with one another into the family of God. And then it goes on, verse 6. One God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. I just want you to think of the Lord's Prayer. When the disciples, they come to Jesus, teach us to pray. What is the first line of the Lord's Prayer? Well, our Father. Here's what I think that we kind of tend to do. We tend to think my Father. Which there is an aspect of that, right? We, we each do have a personal relationship with Jesus if we trusted in him. But it's not primarily personal. It's not just you and Jesus, that's just not biblical, right? Is it you and Jesus? Yes. Is it just you and Jesus? No. Or is it even primarily just you and Jesus? No. Christianity is not primarily about a personal relationship with Jesus. It's about a communal relationship with Jesus. And if you're like, where do you get that? The Bible, right? Like that, I mean, like he's been unpacking it. Paul has throughout all of Ephesians, and nowhere in there does he say, hey, this is the point. It's just you and God. Our father, right? He's not just my heavenly father. He's your heavenly father. We, we, we all, in that sense, we all have the same dad. And, and, and just notice this in these verses, how the Trinity is involved in our unification, right? There's one spirit. There's one Lord, Jesus we all have the one Savior, and we have the one Father. This is why so many places in scriptures, it actually refers to us as the family of God, or it says that, that we're brothers and sisters. Together, we are the children of God. It says that we're the temple of God. We're, we're the, the household of God. We're the bride of Christ. We're the body of Christ. We're fellow citizens. Even just earlier, it says that in, in chapter 2, verse 19, it says that we're members of the household of God. One place it refers to us as one field, right? All of this thing, it's like us together. This is the foundation of the family of God. 
And I just, I just want you to think, there, there's only a few things that last forever. God lasts forever. The souls of men and women. God's word. And the family of God. That's it. That's all that we see clearly in scripture that lasts forever. Is, and one of those things is us. Together. His family. I will not be your pastor forever. Some of you are like, praise God. <laughs> but, but you and I will be brother and sister in, in Christ for eternity. Forever. And so, so what does this mean for us? What does this look like? If, if this is the foundation that we have as the family of God, what does that look like for us to have not just like gospel family, but gospel culture? First, I would say for us is that we, we collectively, you individually, all of us need to have like the right I, mindset. We need to think correctly about church. It's very easy for us to think that, and I would say that this is definitely prevalent in the Midwest, we think that church is something that we primarily attend, not who we are. Nowhere in scripture is it like the thought of like, yes, I attend church. No, Christ made us the church. That's who you are. That's who we are. Right, and so, so, so we, and so, because we think that church is primarily something that we attend, think of how we usually then approach church. If church is an event, then it's all about your preferences. Man, isn't I mean, that's that's American church for you, right? Man, was the music good enough? Did they pick the songs that I liked good enough? Was the pastor funny enough? Man, did it did it did it hit? Did it meet my preferences? Because we think that it's an event. It's, it's, man, this church is not an event. This is who we are. Right? We, we approach it very individualistically. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't die, come, die, and rise again just for you individually to be forgiven or go to heaven when you die. He came to make a family. Right, it even says to, to bring all things to himself. It's communal. And so I think that's where, where one thing starts is for us to have this gospel culture is that we just need to think correctly about the gospel, that we need to correct, correctly think about, about who we are. I, I like this quote, it's by Will, Will Basham. He says this, if in our minds church is a building, we'll go to it. If in our minds, church is an event, we will attend it and we will shop for the most pleasant experience. But if in our minds and in our hearts, church is a family, we won't go to it. We won't shop for it. We will belong to it. So first is our mindset. Second thing is this, like for gospel culture, I would say is this is for us to embrace people. We don't have the option to keep people at arm's length because they're different than you. When I was in school, and I'm in my 40s, so I don't know if this, you know, if this is still a thing, but, but when I was in school, there was, there was definitely groups. There was like the jock group, there was the band group, there was the, the group below the band group that also did comic books and drew stuff. <laughs> there was, there was where there's the jock group, but then there was also the rich jocks. I was not in that group. And I was like, hey, where's the, where's the trailer, trailer group? Um, but... You know, and then there was skaters, and there was cowboys, and there was all these groups. And the thing is, is you, you kind of tried to eventually find, like, all right, where do I belong? I went through a cowboy phase in, like, seventh grade, and then I found out boots stink. I hate this, right? But I'm just like, I'm just like, how do I fit in? And how do I fit in is because we have to have, like, these same likes, we have to kind of be about these same things. Or, you know, you go to uh, the cafeteria and you're like, man, where am I going to sit? I just don't feel like I belong. You go to a wedding and you, I mean, I'm definitely about this. You go to a wedding and you're like, man, I better, I better make sure that whoever's sitting next to me at the reception is awesome. Because I don't want to be stuck with people I don't know and I feel like out of place. But, 
But the gospel's like, man, nobody, nobody should be feeling out of place. We, 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 we embrace one another. And, and so I'd say like gospel culture looks like, man, talking to somebody that you, because the foundation of our family is not in politics, right? The foundation of our family is not stage of life. Emptiness, I, I, and I get it, right? Like, there's something like, I wouldn't mind talking to somebody that has, you know, is in the same, you know, phase of life I am. But ultimately, it's like, but I, I don't get to hold off the empty nesters or whatever it might be, or, the, or the, the people that are young with kids. I can't keep them at arm's length. We have to embrace one another because why? One body, one faith, one family, right? That, that's, that's who we are. None of these things should be keeping us separated because of common interests or, or common income levels or politics or any of those things. And, and I would say like one of the ways that this looks out, like that we could just live this out very, very practically is on Sundays. It's not the only place, but on Sundays, go talk to somebody you don't know. I just say, do you, I mean, I, I am so thankful for our connection team but I would say like, we're all on the connection team. I mean, there are people that, that are stepping into church for the first time in maybe decades, and it's like, man, this is hard for them. There might be people that have actually been to come into the church for a few years, and they still feel lonely. And they still feel like nobody's talking to them. And I know some of you are like, hey, I'm an introvert, and I'd be like, praise God for that. Just talk to one person, you know, <laughs> you know, that's okay, right? But just, just, and if you're like, man, this is awkward. Look, I am awkward. I mean, sometimes I'm awkward because I'm like, hey, you know what? You're basically going to fit somewhere underneath my awkwardness, so you're fine, <laughs> right? You're like, well, I'm not as awkward as that guy. <laughs> He's on staff. That's fine, right? So, so talk to somebody on a Sunday morning, there are people, I mean, like, even studies are showing the next, like, health kind of thing that's out there that they think is the next epidemic is loneliness. People just feel lonely, right? But it's like, hey, but wait a minute. We're a family. That's who we are. And so, even, you know, on Sundays, this is why we have donuts. It's not because we're trying to, like, you know, we're investing in insulin or something like that. You know, like... <laughs> We have donuts to slow people down. That's why we have them. Yeah, kids love them, but, and we want them to have a positive experience. It's just slow down. Grab a cup of coffee. Grab a donut. Talk with someone. Invite someone to lunch. Invite someone to coffee, whatever it might be. But reach out to somebody. So that's the first thing that we, first observation we see is the foundation of family. The next thing that we see is the fight for family. The fight for family. Look at verse, verse one. Therefore, I, a prisoner in the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received. So he's like, hey, this is a way of life. When he says walk, he's saying, hey, this is the lifestyle, the, the way that I want you to live your life. Walk that way. And then how is that way? Verse two, right? With, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. How many of you would say that your like biological bloodline family is sometimes messy? Right? Some of you are like, oh yeah, you're looking at the person next to you. You know, you're like, yeah, them. <laughs> right? F family's hard. But here's the thing. When, when it comes to, and this is something that's really great about Nebraska, is that we're pretty family-oriented, like bloodline family. We'll put up with a lot because, well, that's family. Right? We'll adjust our schedule. Well, man, I, you know, I didn't want it to really look like this at Christmas. Well, that's family man, you know, let's, let's talk through these things. Well, that's family. And, and the same, it actually should even be more so for, for us as the, the family of God, because again, that's going to last forever. That, that we're okay adjusting our lives to one another. Or, or, or you know what? Like church, churches have people, people are messy, Church is messy. There are going to be people in church that bug you, that disappoint you. I will sometimes be one of them. And I think a lot, if we think that church is something that we attend, 
We just avoid it, don't say anything, and either just avoid them or avoid the church altogether and just, we just shuffle the deck. But if church is this family where we, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, here's, here's one of the things that it means. It's like, man, talk about it. Right? If somebody's bugging you, if there's something that's, that's kind of off, talk about it. I know that we don't have a lot of examples in our like society of basically people being adults, but that's kind of what he's saying, right? Like, think about it. If you're kids, if you have two kids and they're fighting, right? You don't just say like, well, you know what? You just don't have to talk to your brother ever again. I mean, they would probably be like, thanks, finally. <laughs> right, but then you wouldn't do that to your kids because one, you would be like, this is part of maturity. But two, you're like, well, you have to work it out. Right? Gospel culture, family culture. Hey, with gentleness, with humility. Right, it's not coming in, you know, like bulldozer person. Hey, if somebody's talking to you, how do we respond? With gentleness, with humility, Bearing with one another in love. And so this is, that's what he's, he's talking about. One of the ways that we fight for family is that we work through it. And so he, he's just going through a bunch of these things. And, and then uh, verse three, the second way that we fight for um, family is this, verse three, where he says, making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Maybe your version says, eager, be eager to maintain it. Gospel family is eager to maintain unity. We're making every effort for it. Man, we got to be unified. And we got, like, we're so eager, right? We're not, we're not reluctant. We're not hesitant. We're not indifferent. No, and, and again, we don't create unity. What we're, where was our unity created? in and through Christ, right? What's, that's how our unity was created. But the scriptures say, yeah, you don't create it, but you do maintain it. You do help foster it, nurture it, make every effort, fight for it. And, and the reality is, is there's so many things that can divide us. There's so many things that can disrupt unity. Somebody said something I didn't like, Right? Or, 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 or differences. And, and unity doesn't mean uniformity. That, that we're all the same. We actually are all different. But it says make every effort to maintain the unity. And so, I, I, man, pray for this. Pray for this for our church. Pray this for, for you and your life. Don't let these other kind of secondary, thirdary, whatever down the line issues get in your way, get in our way of, of being unified. Be eager. And, and I would say one of the ways that, that we're eager, that we make every effort to fight for family, it is just meeting together. I mean, in, in Acts 2.42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the fellowship making every effort, devoted, and they were together. And I think a lot of us really want community. I, th I think we really all kind of want that. If it's like, hey, who wants some c close, biblical, awesome friendships and community? I think probably all of us would raise our hands. But, but if we say like, hey, you're going to have to adjust your schedule to that, somehow it goes from this to this. Open hand to closed fist. And, and, and right, right we, we adjust our lives to, to biological family, to, to a bloodline family, but the same is true. We adjust our lives to the blood-bought family of Christ. That's just like, man, I, I get it. It, it. it takes time. It takes effort. They, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. They're meeting together. It's commitment. And I know that commitment, a lot of times, is inconvenient, and also, like, sometimes I don't like this, that this is, like, something that we super pursue as being this family together, 
because, it, because it's hard, because you'll, we also don't really have a ton of control over it. But it, it just takes commitment. It takes consistency. If you're like, man, I went to a city group once every six months, that's not going to probably get you super far. Right? And it's not like attendance police, but it is this, man, we make every effort. Make every effort to reach unity, reaching out to people, inviting people into our homes. Third point is this. So the, the op- next observation is this, the fruit of family. The fruit of family. And, you know, be, being together in a family, it, it produces something. Um, you know, e- even we just talked about it. If we're fighting for family in all humility, gentleness, bearing with one another of love. You know, if, those, if you're listening to those things, they sound very much like fruit of the spirit things. You know who I do not have to be patient with? People I'm not around. Most of the time. Right? Bearing with one another in love. Right? So even this family of us being this family together, and that's helping foster, you know, very against humility. These things, it's producing something in us. And then he goes on, verse 7. Um, so he says, now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. For it says when, when he, uh, he's starting to quote uh, from, Psalm, um, from Psalm 68 here. He goes, for it says when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to people. But what does it mean? Uh, he ascended means he except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. The one who descended is the one who ascended far above all heavens to fill all things. So this is, that's probably a little confusing right there, but basically he's quoting from Psalms and, and the picture is, is of this victorious leader, somebody that's had victory in, in like a military battle. And Jesus, when it says that, that he's descending to the lower parts of the earth, that's just talking about the earth. Or, or the grave, that Jesus descended, you know, he died, he was buried. But then it says he ascended, right? He, Jesus rose from the grave, and then later on he ascended to sit at the right hand of the Father. And so he's, he's showing Jesus, Jesus is this like, he, he's victorious. And when somebody's victorious, right, like, it, like at the end of verse 8, he gave gifts to people. And so he's, all he's saying is, man, Jesus has this victory, and because of this victory over sin and death, he gives gifts to, to people, to the family of God. And then in verse 11, he, he starts spelling out what these are. And he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ, and so he's saying, man, he's, he's given all these, these gifts, right? For what? To equip all of us for the work of ministry. So he's saying the work of ministry is not a staff thing. It's not a pastor thing. It's a family of God thing. All of us are in the work of ministry. That's for all of us. And then he goes on in verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's son, growing into maturity with the stature measured by Christ's fullness. He's saying, as we exercise these gifts, as we have, as we're being this family of God, it's producing unity in the faith and it's actually producing greater intimacy with Christ. Notice that, verse 13 growing into mature, or he says, and in the knowledge of God's son, growing into maturity. And so here, let me just say plainly, here's what this means. This means that you really won't grow in spiritual maturity by you just working on you. Now, can you work on you and grow, grow some into spiritual maturity? Yep. Right? We, we, you can have a personal time with God or, or work on, you know, spiritual disciplines. But plainly, though, it's saying, but that's not it. If you want to grow into maturity, the way that Christ has designed it, it is going to come more collectively through the family of God than you and your individual effort. That's what it's saying. But gr- greater intimacy with Christ comes through Unity. And, and, and if we look at verse 13, notice, 
We're, 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 we're acting together until we reach unity. And then what does this unity produce? Maturity. What does maturity produce? Unity. See how that works? Unity is producing maturity. Maturity is producing unity within the family of God. And then in verse 14, one of the things that like, so, so this is like, that's again the fruit of the family. The family of God is that it's producing unity. The fruit of the family is that it's producing maturity in all of us. And then in verse 14, it says, then, right, because this is happening, we'll no longer be little children tossed by the waves, blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. And this, this unity that we have with one another actually helps protect us from false teaching. This unity that we have together protects us from the schemes out there, or even just your own brain sometimes, how, right? Like how we get in our own minds and we start to think different things. It's like, no, man, the body of Christ helps protect us in that. Because, and he says, we, we are infants. We're immature. And so all of us, to some degree, are kind of immature. And so it's, well, hey, how do we help with being infants, being together, being this body? And then, you know, we're tossed about by winds and waves. How many of you have been excited about Jesus one moment, and then the next you're not? Right? All of us. All of us. It's like, oh my gosh, Jesus is awesome. Next week is Jesus is even, does Jesus even love me? Right? But the body of Christ helps come around us to one another in that. And it talks about, yeah, it moves us out of infancy. Babies are very selfish. Babies lack discernment. It's like, hey, that's what we are on our own. But the body of Christ helps us to do this together. And then I want you to just notice real quick in verse 13, where it says, um, at the end of it, it says, growing into maturity with a stature that is measured by Christ's fullness. May, uh, the, that's what the, the CSB says, stature, the ESV says into mature manhood or mature person. And so it's like, hey, like just notice this, there's all these plural, right? Saints, gifts, apostles, prophets, teachers, all of these things, right? And it's talking about kind of like those things, but it comes to it and it says, hey, until we reach maturity into the mature person. I know that's like a little confusing, but here, here's what it's saying. As we grow in unity and maturity together, bearing with one another in love, um, with all humility and gentleness, together as the body of Christ together, we grow into maturity into the mature person and a reflection of Christ. That's what it's saying. Because God is, there's one God Three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so God in himself, in Trinity, is unity, plurality, right? Unity, like diversity. Again, one God, and if you're like, I don't fully understand it, that's okay, <laughs> right? One God, three persons. In, and so God himself is in perfect relationship. And you see this play out over the Bible. Jesus himself says, man, I'm only doing what my father tells me to do. Then Jesus says, it's actually better for me to go because you get the Holy Spirit. He's awesome. But the Holy Spirit's like, well, I'm just reminding you of the things that Jesus said. The father says, don't, this, this is my son whom I love and am well pleased. Listen to him. And Jesus, he will be exalted and be given the name above all names. So like we see in God, in God, this, this unity, this, this amazing love, beautiful relationship within himself. And then as we, as the body of Christ, live that out and grow into that, we are growing into the image of the Trinity, into mature, like the mature person. So beautiful. And I just want you to think of like God's plan in, in all of this. How does God plan to reach the world primarily? Through 
the church. You will be my witnesses. Go make disciples. The, tr- the people will know that you are my disciples by what? By your love for one another. In, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says you've been saved by grace through faith. And then in verse 10, it says, but we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Not you singular. It might be you y'all, right? Y'all are created in Christ Jesus to do good works together. That's God's plan. God's plan is like, how am I going to reach the world? Through my people. Yep, they're messy. But that's how he's primarily going to do it. Even when we look again, just kind of going through Ephesians. Ephesians 3, get this. How is God, God wants to show and demonstrate his glory, his manifold wisdom to the world, but also even to, it says, to the heavenlies, to angels. And in verse, or chapter three, verse 10, it says, you know, Paul, is, he's been talking about this mystery and the mysteries that he created the church, unifying Jew, Gentile, one body through Jesus. And in verse, chapter three, verse 10, it says this, He's, he has this mystery of creating the church so that God's multifaceted wisdom may be made known. How is his multifaceted wisdom going to be made known? Through the church. To where? To the rulers and authorities in the heavens. So, so like, how is God going to show his wisdom and glory to angels? Through the church. Isn't that crazy? Through us being a a family together that's bearing with one another in love, with all humility, eager to maintain the unity that we have in Christ. Well, what is God's plan to build us up so that we might see Christ clearly, so that we might grow in intimacy with Christ? Man, the church is God's plan A, right? We just, in verse 16, it says, from whom the whole body fitted and knitted together by every supporting ligament, every piece, every person promotes the growth of the body for the building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. How will you operate properly within the body of Christ? And I I just... Something I get jazzed about this is just like, so if we see God's plan, God's plan to show the world, to show the angels, to show each other Christ is by the church living this out in community, right? If we want a great picture of who God is, we look at Christ. But if we want a great picture of who Christ is, where do we look? I think a lot of times we think that the best place to see the goodness and the glory of God is in nature, Man, I just love getting away to the mountains, the beach. They're great in Nebraska. Right, whatever. And, and, and you know what? That is true. Right? I mean, Psalms tells us, man, the heavens declare. They, they declare the glory of God, right? It's stars and all of these things. Nature is a great place to see the greatness and the bigness of God. But if we look biblically, the church is bigger than mountains. Right? If we look biblically, if we look at God's plan A is Not primarily, I'm not saying not at all, but not primarily through creation, but through his people. That is awesome. Right? So I mean, like, like us together in Christ and that, that, that we're showing who Christ is when Jesus died and rose again, you know what Jesus didn't create? He didn't create more mountains. When Jesus rose and died again, he didn't create more streams, more stars, or any of those things. When Jesus rose and died again, he created a family. Why? So that the world may know. So that the heavenlies may know. So that we may know Christ. Such a beautiful thing. Because mountains can't hug us. Right? Streams can't cry with us. can encourage us, serve one another, be patient with one another, bearing with one another, speaking truth to one another, checking in on one another, confessing sin to one another, but pointing each other to the truth of the gospel, repenting together in family. And as we live this out, just like verse 10 says, it says, so that he, 
Jesus might fill all things with his goodness and glory because we, the family of God, are reflecting who he is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just, um, we thank you, God, that, that you have made us your family, Lord, that, that you've made us just, and, and yeah, we don't, we don't always get it right, uh, Lord, but you, you've, you're moving us, you're filling us, you're empowering us to live this out so that we might reflect Jesus to one another, that we might love one another. And so, Lord, I pray, Lord, that if there's somebody here that's just not connected, Lord, I pray that they would take a step towards towards community. Lord, I pray that we'd take a step towards one another, Lord, in um, just talking with somebody, inviting somebody um, over for, for dinner, for coffee, for, for a walk, whatever it might be. Lord, if, if there are people that, that have, um, you know, they, maybe they've been keeping somebody at arm's length. Maybe there, there's some frustration there. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to just bear with one another in love and, and, and talk about these things that we could respond in, in humility and forgiveness and oneness. Lord, so I pray that, and I'm thankful, God, for, for the family that you've made, for the family that you're, you continue to, to build and create. Lord, I pray that even you continue to do that more and more.